Welcome again. Today we want to talk about parenting, but a specific aspect of parenting. We want to talk about things that we should teach our boys. There are times in the Bible that the Bible addresses everyone. There are other times when the Bible focuses in on a specific gender or age group. The Bible might speak at one point directly to husbands or wives, the young or the old. In the book of Titus chapter 2 and in verse... 6 it says likewise urge the young men to be sensible in all things show yourself to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine dignified sound in speech which is beyond reproach we want to talk about some things that we should be teaching our young men the first thing is we should teach them the value of life in the book of proverbs chapter 12 and verse 10 proverbs 12 and verse 10 The scripture there says, A righteous man has regard for the life of his beast, but the compassion of the wicked is cruel. Our boys need to be taught to respect not only human life, but life in general. There are various laws in the Old Testament that were laws that were directly related to how you treated your animals. For example, in Deuteronomy chapter 25, verse 4, you were not to muzzle your ox while he was threshing. You were to allow him to eat as he worked. In Deuteronomy 22 and verse 10, you were not to yoke together an ox with a donkey. That would be unfair to the donkey. We need to teach our boys that certainly hunting is acceptable. God has placed not only the trees and the plants and things like that here for man, but also animal life as well. Animal life there is food for us. And it is certainly okay to hunt an animal, whether to provide food or self-defense, or if the animal is threatening our livestock or crops or spreading disease. But we need to teach our boys that killing for the sheer fun of it, killing something just to kill it or watch it suffer, is an attitude that God finds offensive. The concept that God introduced, primarily first at the flood, and later on we find in the book of Leviticus, that you're not to eat the blood with the animal, that you're properly to drain an animal, really emphasizes that we're to have respect for the life of that animal. And remember that when we take the life of an animal, basically that life is given that we may live. Something else has died so that we may continue to live. Our lives are valuable to God, and God has allowed us to take the life of another living thing that we might continue on. Any tendency to torture animals is unacceptable. And that really needs to be dealt with early on in your parenting. Along with that, we need to teach our boys the value of mercy and the importance of mercy. Now, there's a lot of passages in the Bible that talk about mercy. One would be in the book of Galatians chapter 5, and in verse 22, where one of the fruits of the Spirit, or part of the fruit of the Spirit, is kindness. Other passages a little further would be a book like Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4 verse 32. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. I think you would agree that we live in a, a world and a culture that doesn't have a whole lot of mercy in it at times, and that should not surprise us. When people move away from God, they naturally are going to move away from kindness, gentleness, and mercy. We see this in Romans chapter 1, where people abandon God, they go into idolatry, and here's what we find, Romans chapter 1 and verse 30, that we find that they, among other things, are without understanding, verse 31, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. should not surprise us when a culture departs from God or gets away from God that what we find in the culture is a lack of compassion, lack of kindness, and a lack of mercy, particularly among the men. If the men in a culture are becoming very calloused, then that tells us that primarily we moved away from God. That's been the mistake we've made. Our boys are eventually going to grow into men, and as men, they're going to have people under them. They're going to have another number of relationships that depend upon their own kindness. 
Their children are going to depend upon their kindness. Their wives are going to depend upon their kindness. And if they own a business, their employees are going to depend upon their mercy. We need to remind them that people that abuse their power are not appreciated by God. God is not impressed with people who abuse their power. And in the book of James chapter 2, in verse 13, it's very clear, judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. We need to teach our boys the importance of compassion. They're going to want compassion from God one day. But if they don't learn to show compassion now, they're never going to receive it. Again, if we have a son, a young man who's growing up, and he's getting a kick out of seeing an animal suffer, or or he's getting a kick out of making his classmates suffer, how is he ever going to learn how to dwell according to knowledge with a wife? Long before that son leaves our home, we need to instill in them the value of mercy and compassion. And we need to get out of them whatever callousness the, the world is trying to inject into them. Also, we need to talk to our sons about violence. Now, what I want to I want to clarify that a little bit. There are times in the Bible where violence has been used and violence has been needed. Book of Romans chapter 13 and verse 4 concerning civil government. It's a minister of God to you for good, but if you do what is evil, be afraid, for it does not bear the sword for nothing. It's a minister of God, an avenger who brings wrath upon the one who practices evil. There is a time for physical force. You might call it violence. There is a time that a policeman is going to have to pull his gun and take the criminal out of the way. That's going to be needed. There are times that a government has to execute the death penalty. There are times that nations have to defend themselves or defend other nations and use military force. What I'm talking about when I talk about violence is, first of all, I'm talking about senseless violence. Again, I'm talking about force for no good reason, violence just for the fun of it. In the book of Genesis chapter 6 and in verse 11, Prior to the flood, here's what God sees, and here's what gets God's, among other things, here's what gets God upset. The earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. We need to be aware of what our sons are watching as far as videos, television, video games, and movies, and things like that. There are certain movies where the bad guy is dealt with that that's what happens to bad guys. But we need to remind our sons, we need to remind our sons that when deadly force is used, even against a bad, gl- a bad guy, we need to remember that that bad guy, that's not the end of them. When the police, when the police have to take down the bank robber, and that's necessary, but we need to realize, though, that that bank robber is now suffering in torment and will suffer there forever. There, there, there is nothing glorious. There is nothing glorious even about removing a bad guy from the picture. It simply means that that bad guy now has no more opportunities to repent and is now suffering for his or her crimes. In the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 10, and so there should be, there should be an awareness, yes, That force has to be used against evil. But there should be a certain soberness about when force is used. An awareness, an awareness of where this person is now. Matthew chapter 10, 28. Do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And so we need to have the right perspective on that. We should... We should be very careful about becoming entertained by violence, that somehow we will watch a movie and the movie have all sorts of violence in it and we'll say, wow, was that cool. We need to have a more mature attitude towards the place and role of violence. I also now want to talk about what many people have called sportsmanship. 
A lot of boys are involved in sports over the course of their lifetime, especially when they're young. First of all, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 15, that text says, But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves in all your behavior. In all your behavior. Something that I think as parents we need to remind our sons is that they are expected to behave themselves even on the field of competition. Just because they're involved in a, a competitive game or maybe the most important game at the end of the season, maybe a playoff game, that doesn't mean that they have the right to no longer act like a Christian. God expects us to act like a Christian in all our behavior. And maybe if our sons see their fathers acting like a Christian in all their behavior, that is, the sons see the fathers acting like a Christian in their business while they're under stress in every occasion when they have a disagreement with mom, maybe our sons would get the point that there is no time in my life that I'm allowed to kind of turn off the switch and stop acting like a Christian. I'm expected to be good and holy in every aspect of my life, and that includes, that includes when I'm involved in a very intense basketball game, or when I'm playing in a playoff football game, or playing in soccer, or whatever it may be. I'm still expected to act like a Christian. Now, I want to make some applications there, what that means. What that, mean, what that means would be that even, even, even in the middle of competition, I am still always to have respect for authority, whether it's my coach, coach of the other team, or the umpire. Never appropriate to argue with the umpire. Maybe fewer sons would argue with the umpire if they saw fewer fathers arguing with the umpire. But the umpire is the authority, okay, and you accept his decisions. You don't boo him. You're not a backseat driver. You're not there saying things behind his back. You need to learn humility. That's the second point. Everyone makes mistakes and errors. Even the best hitters only hit in Major League Baseball, if you're, if you're only hitting one out of three times, you're considered a very good hitter. You will always encounter another player or another team that's better than you. And that, that's why I'm not a big fan of people holding up their finger and saying, we're number one, we're number one. But there's always going to be someone out there who's better. I need to be humble about that. Also, you need not only to have the right attitude when you're winning, but you need to have the right attitude when you're losing. And even when you're losing by a whole lot. You need to have the right attitude also when you're not playing. Maybe the coach is taking you out, putting another player in. You need to have the right attitude and be rooting for the player that has been put in your place. You need to make sure that you're not hoping that he messes up or that he looks bad. That's not maturity. You also need to help others. It's easy to be on a team where someone, when some of the kids on the team are not as talented as you are. They can't throw as well or hit as well. They haven't had as much instruction as you have had. It's easy to make fun of them. And that's not a godly attitude. A mature person will help someone on the team who's struggling. A mature person will try to give them pointers on throwing, catching, batting doing a jump shot, whatever it may be. If you see someone on the team that cannot play as well, help them, encourage them, uh, praise them for when they do what is right. How would you like to be treated? How would you like to be treated if you were the player that simply because of physical ability or maybe lack of instruction, you were not as good as the rest of the players? I also think that sports are a great place to learn the difference between what's eternal and what's temporary. What has lasting value, what has temporary value. Life doesn't end when you win the league championship. Life does not end when you become state champions. Life doesn't end after you win the winning touchdown or make the winning touchdown or hit the game winning home run or score the final goal. Our children, our sons, are going to have an entire life to live after the glory days of Little League or high school or even college. They're going to have a lot of years 
after their ability to play at a competitive level. What are they going to do then? What are they going to do then? And I think you need, we need to be able to teach them that there's a lot more to life than this. That is, we need to teach them you're learning some skills here, etc., and teamwork, but this is only a game. This is not the most important thing you're involved in. There's a race that's far more important than this race, than this physical race you're in. That is the race for the Christian life. That's the true thing that you must win. That's the true thing in which you must finish. Sports are also a great place to help our kids understand that God is first. Book of Matthew chapter 6 and in verse 33. Matthew 6, 33, Seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. I also want to get in there a passage like the great commandment, Matthew chapter 22. Verse 37, You shall love the God, Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Our boys need to be taught that in order to make it to heaven, in order to be right with God, they have to give God their best, that God has to be the number one priority. That God has to get their best effort and their best love and their best time. Again, sports. Sports are a great place to teach this lesson. That is, the most important thing is not this sport, the most important thing is not this team or hobby, recreation activity, whatever it may be. The most important thing is God. So. Whether they're in Little League or soccer or youth football or whatever it may be, God always comes before Little League. God always comes before practice. God always comes before a game. God always comes first. And I think that's a great place to instill those values. Find the play. Great to play. If you're good at it, great. But being good at a sport does not allow you to put God on hold for a while. I think there's a great lesson we can teach our kids there. And no use, you know, I know sometimes parents are tempted to say, well, that's hard because they may miss a practice here and there because they need to be at services or Bible study, and that might hurt them. Hey, you might as well have them learn the lesson now because tell you what, things are not going to get easier. What are they going to do when they get a job? What are they going to do when they're out looking at a job and they're looking at a job where that company wants them to work every Sunday? They're going to have to learn to make some hard decisions while they're young because decisions, the things at stake, are not going to get any easier. They're going to have an entire life of things and they're going to try to come between them and God. Better, better teach them early on, God comes first. That is, everyone, everything else and everyone else is going to have to work around God. The main thing in the schedule is God. And whether it's recreation, a hobby, career, whatever, all that has to work around God. Because tell you what, this sport didn't die for my sins, and that hobby didn't die for my sins, and that company out there didn't die for my sins. God did. He re deserves my loyalty. He deserves being first place. That will also help them in the family and marriage. Important lesson we can teach our sons on priorities. If God is first, everything is naturally going to follow in the right place. There's something else that we need to teach them, and that is humility. One of the pitfalls that a lot of young men face is the pitfall of arrogance. Uh, thinking that we're smarter than we really are. Especially when our boys are very good at something, when they're very good at a sport. It might be even school or a topic when they're extremely smart and sharp and intelligent. One of the pitfalls will be that they might think that being good at that uh, uh, removes them from being accountable in other areas. book of Proverbs 29-23 says, A man's pride will bring him low but a humble spirit will obtain honor. The path to honor is not through sports or academics. The true path to honor is through a humility before God. That's a truth path to honor. And you've, you've seen that. I, I want to warn fathers and mothers here about making the mistake of pampering a son or daughter 
especially her son or daughter who is really good. Oh, just at whatever the culture values, good at sports, good at music, good at academics, whatever it may be. Because the temptation is to allow that child to get away with things. The temptation is to allow that child not to clean up the room, not to help out on chores, not, not to be there at services or Bible study, because after all, they got a performance, they got a game, and they're really good at that, and they're going to make the big time one day. Well, don't make that mistake. Compliment your son, encourage your son, work with your son, but you remind your son that no, no matter how talented you are, you're just like everybody else. No matter if you scored the winning touchdown last night, this morning, clean up your room. Help mom with putting the dishes out of the dishwasher. You've still got responsibilities in this family. Just because you're good at something doesn't mean that you get to sleep in longer than anybody else does doesn't mean that you don't have to do chores like everybody else does. doesn't mean that, you know, well, you don't need to go into services like everybody else does because somehow you're special. We need to remind them that being good at something does not make them any, special, any more special than anybody else. That is, we need to remind them of what God values. In the book of Micah, Micah chapter 6 and verse 8, and again, I like sports, and I like academics, and I'm impressed with people that are you know, really talented and good at things, but we need to remind ourselves with what God is impressed by. Micah 6 and verse 8. He has told you, O man, what is good, what does the Lord require of you, what to do justice, love kindness, to walk humbly with you, God. That's what God values above anything else. Well, we also need to teach our young men to honor women. Now, I know our culture claims to be very open-minded and and uh, that we honor women. And I don't believe that. I don't believe that our culture honors women that much at all. You go to the local checkout stand and you see the magazines there and you see the type of clothes that they put the women and models in and it's not honoring. It's degrading. You see the number of people in our culture that actually defend, will defend the existence of pornography will defend the rights of pornography. I'm, I'm amazed at how people can de defend something that is so degrading to women. I don't think our culture has a good handle at all of what it means to honor women. And I certainly don't see it in movies and Hollywood and television shows and female models and retail ads and commercials. Uh, there, there's something going on there, but it is not honor. Honoring women, honoring women, I want to make an application here, includes honoring motherhood and a woman's raising her children. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14, Paul said to young widows, Therefore I want younger widows to get married, bear children, keep house, and give, no occasion, and give the enemy no occasion for reproach. He does not tell young widows, get out there and evangelize all the time, even though evangelism is very important. So almost he's saying there's something more important than that, than that, it, that, that being at home with children, raising children, is a very valuable thing. Titus chapter 2 and verse 5, we see the same thing. That they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure workers at home, kind, being subjected to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be dishonored. That's God's view of the matter. Our boys, as they go off to college, are going to face a lot of worldly attitudes about women. Even from so-called enlightened learning centers. Uh, they're going to encounter people who think that a, that a woman who has children and stays at home to raise them, that she's wasting her life, that what is she doing? She's wasting her skills, wasting her talents, wasting her life. And that's a worldly, ignorant view. And young men are going to be taught in different business classes and things like that, or the general attitude in a, in a fraternity will be that, hey, if you're going to make it, if you're going to make it in the world, you've got to put in long hours at work, 
And yeah, your wife is going to complain about you being you gone all the time, but all wives complain about that, and that's just part of being successful. That early on, you've got to put all those hours in there, and then later on, you'll have time for the kids. And that's another ignorant point of view. Also, our young men are going to encounter all the latest fads on raising children. That is all the fads that don't work. Honoring women, honoring women includes honoring the value of a woman who stays at home to raise her children. That's the most important thing that a woman could do because that's the next generation. That's the future of any civilization. A woman who stays home and raises her kids basically has more influence than a woman that may be the a CEO of a company. That's really where the influence is. That's really where the power is. Another way of honoring women would be is the way we look at them. And that's something else that we need to teach our young men. And fathers need to teach that lesson. Too often that lesson comes from the mother about the lesson on lust and things like that comes from mother. That needs to be that needs to come from the father. Matthew chapter 5, verse 28, But I say that everyone who looks on a woman to lust for her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. The last thing our young men to hear is, well, every man lusts, and I can, you can't help but looking, or there's no harm in looking, or everyone does that, or it's unreasonable not to look. Everyone does. And that's the last thing they need to hear. They need to hear that lusting upon a, a woman, lusting upon a woman is inexcusable. There's no excuse for that. That's something that a man does not do. A man controls his eyes. A man controls his heart. A man controls his mind. Because, because that woman you're lusting on is someone's daughter. You don't want someone lusting for your daughter, do you? That's someone's wife or potential wife. You want someone lusting after your wife? And eventually, that's someone's mother. That's going to be someone's mother. may already be someone's mother, but that's going to be someone's mother. You want someone lusting for your mother? Obviously not. We need to teach our boys the right perspective on lust and the way to control it. And, that it, and it's inexcusable. It's just inexcusable. Also, we need to teach our sons what it means to honor a woman in marriage. First Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Husbands, likewise, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with a weaker vessel, since she is a woman, and grant her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life to the end, that your prayers may not be hindered. Honoring a woman in marriage would mean listening to their advice, valuing their input, being concerned about what's in her eternal best interest. Thank you, putting her ahead of your needs. Don't expect her to act or react like a man. Taking time to discover what she likes, what she values, what she thinks, what she wants, what she needs, what she desires, and what concerns she has. A man who honors his wife finds out all of those things and then, to the best of his ability, meets them. Tries to meet those needs. That's really what it means to be the head of a wife, to be the leader. To love your wife as Christ loved the church. That is, you, you sacrifice yourself for her. Our, our, our sons, our sons need to hear a lot more about service and sacrifice than getting ahead. They need to hear a lot more about service than being successful in a materialistic sense. That's what they need to hear because all true servants are the real successful people in this world. We don't want our sons to end up like the man, like many ha men have, very successful in business or whatever it may be, very success for sex, successful in earthly things, and a complete failure when it comes to marriage and parenting. Relationships. 
The quality of your relationships, that's where you measure a man's success. Whether it's his relationship with God, the relationship with his wife, or the relationship with his children, or his brethren, fellow man, that's where you measure his success. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about integrity. We need to teach our sons the importance of integrity. And one other problem in our culture besides lust and dishonor is the problem of dishonesty. We, we live in a world where people don't value the truth, God's truth. As a result, they don't value being truthful to other people. We live in a world where people lie about the simplest things. Again, there's lying is it, it, there's never a good reason to lie. And often people have thought about well, lying in case your life is in danger, or whatever. But we're not even talking about that. Studies have shown studies have shown that people in this country are lying about some of the most unimportant things. In the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, and verse 4, it says, When you make a vow to God, do not be laid in pain it, for he does not delight in fools. Pay what you vow. God expects you to keep your promises. Practical areas for our sons. If you're going to leave a job, you give your notice. Two weeks or whatever the job says, you give proper notice. If you're going to make a specific commitment to a company, school, or a program, you keep your commitment. You don't just keep hopping from, well, what, what, I'm going to be here just as long as until the next best, best thing uh, comes up. You keep your commitments. You, you honor. You honor your agreement. And, and if you want out of the agreement, then you do it in the honorable way. You give proper notice. And in marriage, you, you make a commitment to a woman, you keep that commitment. Our sons eventually are going to go into some type of career or business, and sadly, they may be surrounded by a number of people who lie. Lie to get ahead, lie to stay out of trouble, and that's a bad idea. We need to tell our sons, anyone who lies to, get, to start to stay out of trouble is only building up bigger trouble for themselves. Whether it gets you in trouble or not, you tell the truth. You tell the truth. You be honest and fair in dealing with others. If you're in sales, you be honest with your customers. If you're in marketing, you be honest with the product. You be honest in the advertising. God does not like people who lie. And I know there's all sorts of justifications for white lies and stretching the truth and things like that. But someone says, not, uh, you know, um, when you stretch the truth, you, you basically destroy. The truth. Nothing ruins the truth like stretching it. Book of Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, But for the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, and murderers, and moral persons, sorcerers, and, all, and idolaters, and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. We've been warned. We've been warned, and God is not going to turn a blind eye to dishonesty. We need to teach our young man the importance of integrity. Primarily, honesty with the woman they marry. Honesty about, where, what have you done today? Where have you been today? Honesty about money. Honesty about the paycheck. Honesty about where the money goes. Honesty about a budget. Honesty about where is the money invested. Honesty about how much do we have in a bank account. Honesty about what bills have been paid. Honesty about what are you looking at on the internet. What movie were you watching last night. Honesty about your schedule. Nothing destroys marriage like dishonesty. Nothing destroys the trust in marriage like it as well. But we need to teach our sons the importance of honesty with the people that they love and the people that love them. This is basically the first part of this lesson. There will be a second part, Teaching Our Boys Part 2. But I, I hope that you found this helpful. 
if you have any questions, you can always call me at 503-644-9017 or see us on the web, www.bevertonchurchofchrist.net. Thank you.